Todd Castle and McCormick will be seen tonight so we can bring you a very special episode of The Gen X Files. Welcome to The Gen X Files. I'm Jim. I'm Adam. And today's show is all about The, the Day, Day After. After. Yeah, we figured y'all had a way too good a time with our <laughs> Star Wars celebration, and you needed little vegetables. Time with your to, birthday cake. Time to bring it down a notch. Yep, like six <laughs> notches. Let's be honest. Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, this is uh, June Doom June Doom Two, the sequel. Our sequel to uh, June Doom, which was last year. Yeah. Uh, more fun and destruction. Yeah, we we figured we'd start it off with the doomiest Doom of all. Oh my god! The actual Doom that we could. <laughs> then we're we're back under the thumb of. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's fun, Vladimir Putin. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So, oh man, this event because it was an event. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, everybody at schools, they were like, you should watch this. And it was just like this thing where everybody stopped and watched this horrific movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Which, we were talking about it. I thought it was a miniseries. I remember. And I also thought that I was a lot younger when I saw it. No, no. Because it was 83. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, I mean, we were still doing duck and cover drills. Oh, yeah, me too. At school where we were preparing for a nuclear uh, strike. Yeah. Which, you know. Those school desks back in the day, say what you will, but they would protect you from a nuclear explosion. Uh, ours, ours was textbooks. We would put a textbook over our head, yeah. and then we would cower by the lockers for some reason, because apparently the radiation doesn't affect the metal. Well, we had lead line textbooks back then sure we that did. were very helpful. We well, would also take our textbooks in when we get x-rays. It was once you added on the paper bag cover, that was, <laughs> right. that was what protected you from the radiation and the nuclear blast. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but we still did it. We still did it because it gave us a false sense of security. It was so stupid. <laughs> Even then, I'm like, what is what is this going to... No. 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 But up until then, a lot of... Th- this was the most realistic depiction oh, yeah. of the time. Yeah. yeah oh, no, sure. no, you know, no punches pulled. You know, before this, we had stuff like, you know, most of the nuclear movies were like, oh... Ants got huge. Yeah, or yeah. It was brain about, is alive. Yeah, it was about radiation yes, and like and, the and, weirdness of that, or and how it, or Godzilla right, coming right. out of the ground. Yeah, it was yeah. about creating monsters and mutants right. and and there was no actual things. realness to what'll happen if no. a bomb hits your town. No, there weren't a lot of teeth falling out and hair falling <laughs> out and skin oh, smooshing off. That the... Poor guy. God, he was. It was awful. <sighs> yeah, uh, but I do. I do find it really ironic though, because halfway through the movie, we're watching it, and I turned to Jim, and I was like, you know, it just occurred to me that literally since this movie aired, nothing has changed. Oh no, we've got maybe a few less nukes. Well, yeah, I mean, there was look, there was a pathway towards denuclearization. Yeah. that started right. with Reagan and Gorbachev. Yeah, yeah, but it you know it only went so far. It was mostly a PR stunt, let's be honest. Yeah, I you mean, know. it did it did eliminate some, but right? Like, but well, instead of being able means. to destroy the world t- three hundred times over, Adam, <laughs> no, we could only do it a hundred times. Over. I know, I know. So, but uh, but you know, progress. the best the best thing to happen is for the Soviet Union to dissolve, and now the nukes are just in the hands of weirdos that sure. do whatever they want. <laughs> yes, exactly. Let's <laughs> let's give it to the Chechen. Uh, so I'm mafia. I'm, I'm going to rescind my comment and say that things are actually worse now than they were before because who knows what the hell Putin's thinking. We do because he uh, says it and we have never I don't remember Brezhnev or Gorbachev or any of these guys saying, oh, I'm going to use it." Oh no, I think we no, should use no. it. They would never even dare. I mean, you know. they understood what would happen. <laughs> and even look, the nukes that Putin is talking about are more strategical surgical nukes, yeah, but they're yeah. still nukes. I mean, they're still going to decimate land. Yes, and they're yeah. still going to soil the land and, so, you know, and, and kill and, so many people. And, uh, and, and salt the land for years, you know, for, for decades. It's going to be destroyed. <laughs> this is going to be a great episode. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Get your tissues handy. All right. It's going to be a laugh riot. You're going to be laughing, crying, <laughs> laughing. Take yourself back to 1983. Yeah. April 22nd, a reactor shutdown due to failure of fuel rods occurs at Kursk Nuclear Power Plant in Russia. Yeah, beginning of their troubles. Yeah, yeah. This is because I want to say I think Chernobyl was 86? 85 or 86. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah. It's so I, weird to think it was in the 80s. I thought it was like... No, no. 
It was, uh, yeah. September 26th, Soviet military officer Stanislav Petrov averts a worldwide nuclear war by correctly identifying a warning of attack by U.S. missiles as a false alarm. This is insane. This guy is the biggest hero of the world. Yeah. He saved, literally saved the world from annihilation, and nobody knew about him until just a few years ago. Yeah, yeah. It was this totally kept secret. Just this dude who was, he defied orders and was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do this. They probably sent him to the gulag for I it. Probably. Probably why we didn't hear from him. He yeah. eliminated him from the history. Thank you, it was Red, for saving world. Now time for you to go to Siberia. It was actually the second time this happened because it happened during the Cuban mil- missile crisis. There was a sub off of Cuba that was given orders to start nuking the U.S. and the sub commander was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. And and didn't. Good. I yeah. mean, this is the thing is, is thank Goodness, we've got humanity <laughs> involved, and it's not just an automated system, because yeah. if it were, then we would be dead twice over. Well, and we have people with actual conscience, consciousnesses, conscience, Consciences. like a good conscience, yes. to, to not just be like, yeah, whatever, let's do this. Well, that was what was so disturbing in the day after, was just the absolute dispassionate way that these guys oh they were following the world. orders world yeah. yeah but it They're was just like just, all right here we go they Turn did the that so well it was boop, boop, boop. so oh, it was done so it well. was such like a documentary style yeah and these kids look like they were 10 years old man oh, these I little know. army guys I know, I know they were literally destroying the world these little boys yeah. that are destroying the world it was so it was so effective but they were fine they were locked up they had like two weeks worth of food so they were fine sure yeah <laughs> Uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, it, was, it was great. It was yeah, done it was well, awesome. I should say. <laughs> yeah, I great. loved it. Uh, November 7th, Abel Archer 83. Many Soviet officials misinterpret this NATO exercise as a nuclear first strike, causing the last nuclear scare of the Cold War. Of the Cold War. So that literally happened only like two weeks before November 20th, the day after airing on ABC. You know, ABC was like, whoa, come was, on, <laughs> nuclear strike. <laughs> it was prime. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, so the day after starts with Brandon Stoddard, the ABC motion picture division president. He saw the China syndrome and wondered what the fallout from an actual nuclear war would look like. Stoddard was a driving force for TV miniseries in the early 80s, greenlighting the Thornbirds and the Winds of War. Both good. Yeah. Uh, Stoddard asked the executive, I think the Winds of War was the one that was like 30 hours long. Mm. Uh, we talked about it uh, previously. Uh, Herman Woke? Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Because I think it was directed by the guy who did The Omega Man. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I think so, too. All of this, it's funny how all of this is just so incestual. And oh, yeah. And yeah. all of these shows, it's that we get the same, you know, usual gang of idiots that seem to pop I, up. And Hollywood was a weird small town back in the day. It was. But a lot of the stuff that we're covering is, is you know, kind of ancillary to other stuff that right, we're covering. Right. So it kind of makes sense. Stoddard asked his executive vice president of television movies and miniseries, Stu Samuels, to develop a script. Samuels created the title the day after to emphasize that the story was about not a nuclear war itself, but the aftermath. Right, which is the most disturbing part of a nuclear war. Yeah, because if there is a nuclear war, you should pray that you're one of them to be hit directly. (laughs) Yeah, you want to be one and done, baby. Surviving is awful. You want to be one of those glowing... You want to be one of those glowing skeletons that (laughs) turns into a Pompeii statue. Samuel suggested several writers, and eventually Stoddard commissioned the veteran television writer Edward Hume to write the script in 1981. Old Eddie Hume. Oh, old Eddie Hume. During the 1970s, Hume wrote the pilot scripts for four television series, A Canon, which aired on CBS for five seasons. Nice, with big old chubby. Big old chubby? <laughs> yeah. What was his name? He was um, also in Jake and the Fat Man. Yeah, it was... Uh, no, I'm not going to remember his name. He was a good actor. Yeah, anyway. Barnaby Jones, which ran on CBS for eight seasons. Woo, doggies. That had Jed Clampett in it. Oh, it did. Old Epson. What is it? Buddy Epson. Buddy Epson. Yeah. Woo, doggies. The, I'm, gonna, I'm Barnaby Jones. The Streets of San Francisco, which aired on ABC for five seasons. Nice. Michael Douglas's debut. Oh, yeah, that's right. And uh, Toma, which aired on ABC for one season. No idea what that is. Uh, during the week of April 21st, 1974, all four series appeared together in the Nielsen Top 20 ratings. Wow. That's impressive. It is. Imp- I mean, he was, a, he was a juggernaut, man. He was a TV He uh, was. Legend. ABC was concerned about the graphic nature of the film and how to portray the subject appropriately on a family-oriented television channel. Well, yes, and this was also at the time where TV was very different. It had yeah. a lot of different rules and regulations. The family hour, which was basically 7 to 9, you yeah. couldn't have any – you couldn't even say ass. You oh, could yeah. barely yeah. say hell. I don't think you could say hell. You couldn't say damn. You could definitely not say goddamn. 
Right, right, right. But, uh, and violence. Violence was okay, but nobody could die. Like, it could be like... Yeah, you couldn't depict someone dying. You could, could depict it, like, right up to the moment. Yeah. But it's Maybe like... off screen. Well, it, but mostly it would be, like, spectacular explosions with right. doing the old Chucky Heston coming out with your clothes. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. messed up and a little bloody and, and dusty. <laughs> Hume undertook a massive amount of research on nuclear war and went through several drafts until ABC finally deemed the plot and characters acceptable. While Hume was writing the script, he and producer Robert Papazian, who had great experience in on-location shooting, took several trips to Kansas City to scout locations and met with officials from the Kansas Film Commission and from the Kansas Tourist Offices to search for a suitable location for Hampton, the fictional, the fictional Kansas City featured in the script. Nice. Papazian ended up selecting Lawrence because of the access to a number of good locations, a university, a hospital, football and basketball venues, farms, and a flat countryside. Yeah, I mean, from the beginning of the movie, before the annihilation, it looks like a really nice town. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lawrence is great. I I had a cousin that went to KU in Lawrence. Uh, It's a very fun town. It's it's one of those, like, weird kind of progressive areas inside Mm. a very conservative state. Interesting. I like it. Lawrence was also agreed upon as being the quote-unquote geographic center of the United States. The Lawrence people were urging ABC to change the name Hampton to Lawrence in the script. Come on. We want to be the ones that are blown up. Come on. I mean, technically, it definitely makes it more real. You know, I mean, but this is a real town. But Lawrence, since 83, for, for... 40 years, which is so crazy that we did the Return of the Jedi 40th anniversary, and now we're doing the the day after 40th anniversary. Very similar films. Um, Yeah. Very similar vibes. Uh, It's just, it's funny that. From for 40 years, Lawrence has been like, the home of the day after. Yeah, I know. I know. If you want to know what it's like to be nuked, come to Lawrence. (laughs) Back in Los Angeles, the idea of making a TV movie showing the true effects of nuclear war on average American citizens was still stirring up controversy. Well, sure, because people were scared S-less of it. Yeah. And also the government kind of downplayed it because the realities of it are so horrifying. Yeah. That yeah. they didn't want people to be constantly in a state of freak oh, it, out. Yeah, it would be bad. But it's also important to show the reality of it so people aren't so cavalier about, like, you know, well, it's just nuke Russia. Right, right, exactly. I agree. I agree. And I think a lot of people in government now need a viewing of this movie because they're way oh, yeah. too uh, yeah. cavalier with the old nuke dukes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. ABC human Papazian realized that for the scene depicting the nuclear blast, they would have to use state-of-the-art special effects, and so took the first step by hiring some of the best special effects people in the business to draw up some storyboards for the complicated blast scene. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was, yeah. ABC then, ABC then hired Robert Butler to direct the project. Uh, Butler directed such shows as... The Untouchables, Dr. Kildare, The Dick Van Dyke Show, Batman, The Fugitive, and The Twilight Zone. Butler also shot pilots for many TV series, including... The original Star Trek, Shane, Hogan's Heroes, Batman, The Blue Knight, Hill Street Blues, Remington Steel, a show which he also co-created, Moonlighting, Sisters, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. Moonlighting was great, and, uh... Yeah. Hogan's Heroes was great. I mean, great. Steel, they were all... I haven't heard of The Blue Knight, but I mean, like, these all, shows all did very well. The Blue Knight was Batman's cousin. He was <laughs> He the, was just sad. Yeah, he wasn't the Dark Knight. He was the Blue Knight. He was sad. He had a, a lot of times would accompany Batman on his, his nightly sojourns and just bitch and complain. <laughs> so sad. Why didn't anybody like me, Batman? If I wanted somebody to complain, I would just have brought Robin back. Oh, sorry about that. For several months, the group worked on drawing up storyboards and revising the script over and over. Then, in early 1982, Butler was forced to leave the day after because of other contractual commitments. Okay. ABC then offered the project to two other directors who both turned it down. Finally, in May, ABC hired the feature film director, Nicholas Meyer, who had just completed the blockbuster Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. It was tricky to get a director for that because it was an extremely controversial Oh, subject. I, I, yeah. And it's kind of a no win situation for the director because if you do a crappy job, then you completely yeah. do disservice to a horrible, horrifying reality. Right. And if you do too good a job, well. You're the guy that always directed that nuclear holocaust <laughs> movie. <laughs> guy that scared the ass out of everybody. Uh, and it definitely had a huge effect on Nicholas Meyer. So, I mean, I, I can't imagine. Yeah. Anyway, I think we'll, it had a huge we'll effect on everybody involved. No, I realize. Yeah. But I. 
It, we'll get to it at the end, but yeah. Meyer first gained public attention for his best-selling 1974 Sherlock Holmes novel, The 7% Solution, a story of Holmes confronting his cocaine addiction with the help of Sigmund Freud. The movie would eventually be made into a film with a script written by Meyer. Yeah, it's a good movie. It's got Robert Duvall. And yeah. He made his directing debut in 1979 with Time After Time, the film about H.G. Wells having a real time machine and using it to chase Jack the Ripper into the present. This is the one that I liked. Yeah. Time yeah. after time, not somewhere in time. No, no, somewhere in time. Which was the a... poor late Christopher Reeve flopperoo. Yeah, Richard Matheson novel. Yes, uh, it was, yeah. In 1986, Meyer was asked to help write the script for Fatal Attraction, directed by Adrian Lynn. Uh, we have talked about him previously in our Fatal Attraction episode, so please listen to that. If you haven't already, you probably have. You probably have, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Meyer was apprehensive at first and doubted ABC would get away with making a television film on nuclear war without the censors diminishing its effect. That's another thing, too. It had to be realistic. It had to be effective. Yeah. And if it just yeah. got watered down by the censors, then, you know. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, well, it's gonna, it loses the whole effect. Like, the whole point right. is gone. But then it's like, oh, well, then nuclear, it's not that bad. Hey, it's like a day in the park. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> oh, you get a little cold, but... Well, they'll all be dead, but we're not. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, however, after reading the script, Meyer agreed to direct the day after. Meyer wanted to make sure that the, he would film the script he was offered. He did not want the censors to censor the film or the film to be a regular Hollywood disaster movie from the start. Yeah, he didn't want... Look, this is just coming after a lot of the Irwin Allen disaster films, yeah, Earthquake, yeah. and Poseidon Adventure. They were huge in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. and all of the airport and airplane well, or airport so movies. so many airport movies, yeah. Uh, Meyer figured the, uh, Meyer figured the more the day after resembled such a film, the less effective it would be. And he preferred to present the facts of nuclear war to viewers. Yeah. Because if they had it like that, you know, if they, if they made it like, you know, a Chuck Heston hero, that's, you know, getting all of the yeah, survivors yeah. to some place, you know, and made it kind of that yeah. kind of thing. It's like, it, it wouldn't work. It has to be a slice of it, life. Life is not an action movie right. or a disaster movie. And showing, I mean, the beauty, uh, we'll get into it. Yeah. Uh, he made it very clear to ABC that he did not want any big TV or film stars to be in the movie. Uh, ABC, ABC agreed, but wanted to have one star to help attract European audiences to the film when it would be shown theatrically there. Later, while flying to visit his parents in New York City, Meyer happened to be on the same plane with Jason Robards and asked him to join the cast. Hey, are you Jason Robards? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm Jason Robards. You want to be in my nuclear movie? All right. Sure. He was fantastic in this. He's fantastic yeah. in everything. Jason yeah, Robards has got that gravitas that they needed oh, for yeah. that role. Because he's yeah, yeah, exactly. Jason Robards also had two other films come out in 1983. Max Dugan Returns, the feature written by Neil Simon and co-starring Marsha Mason, Donald Sutherland, and Matthew Broderick. Hey, Max Dugan's Returns. <laughs> oh, hi, Max Dugan. Sorry. Another Neil Simon movie I've not seen. Uh, I'm Max Dugan, and I'm back, and not for. Guys, not gonna be good. So crappily. <laughs> I can't imagine him doing any kind of like action or thriller stuff. Well, that it just was a so much more deliberate. Like yeah, a, that yeah. was like a, a serial comedy. You know? Right, right. Like right. every Neil Simon. Yeah. Yes. Is, yes. That's you true. know, if you've seen one, like I love Neil Simon, but if yeah. you've seen one Neil Simon, you've pretty much seen them all. <laughs> he was also in Something Wicked This Way Comes, co-starring Jonathan Price, Diane Ladd, and Pam Greer, with a script written by Ray Bradbury based on his 1962 novel. Oh, God, I still remember the trailer for that. For something oh, yeah. wicked this way comes, and the, all the lightning and stuff behind him is the wicked. It was a, it was a weird, weird movie. <laughs> Do you remember that movie? Um, I don't think I've seen it. I want to say I think I read the book. Uh, we're definitely going to have to do uh, this movie. Yeah, yeah. Robards would become one of the 24 people who have joined the Triple Crown of Acting Club, having won a Tony in 1959, an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in 1976 for All the President's Men. He was so good. And winning an Emmy for Inherit the Wind in 1988. He was just also one of those guys that's kind of like Jimmy Stewart that has integrity. Yeah, yeah. That can, that can really show compassion and integrity and that's why he was yeah. perfect for this role. You, be, yeah, you believe him as being that guy. I'm going to turn to if it's something's going bad. Yeah. yeah, and and being the guy that everybody turns to, and you're dying. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it was a really complicated role that he had to play. Oh my god, he was so good. He was and so he good. was excellent. Robards would be nominated for six more Tonys, four more Emmys, and win another Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in 1977, playing Dashiell Hammett in Julia. 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 <laughs> He was certainly a git for the production. Oh, uh, yeah. Look, the guy was huge. Yeah. 
With the acting cred from Robards on board, Nicholas Meyer dove into several months of nuclear research, which made him quite pessimistic about the future, to the point of becoming ill each evening when he came home from work. Yeah, that's not something you want to just dive headfirst into for months. can't imagine. I mean, this is it just the stress of having to deal with this and and knowing how much worse it actually is uh uh, well they couldn't portray it realistically or people would throw up i mean they would yeah they would be traumatized like fully effing traumatized meyer and papazian also made trips to the abc censors and to the united states department of defense during their research phase and met with roadblocks with both groups Of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, surprise. Meyer had many heated arguments over elements in the script that the network censors wanted cut out of the film. The Department of Defense said that it would cooperate with ABC if the script clarified that the Soviets launched their missiles first, which Meyer and Papazian took pains not to do. Mm, You gotta make it the Soviets first. You gotta. I mean, they even even talk about it in the movie. Yeah. (laughs) Like, it's literally like, I just want to know. And yeah. And then the best answer does it matter? Yeah, exactly. We're st- we're still here. If you, you know? launched your new launched your nukes five minutes before ours, or we did the other way, what does it matter? Everyone's dying. Everybody's anyway. morally bankrupt. I, yeah. Everybody is morally bankrupt uh, because you know you're just retaliating. You're, I get it, but I don't get it. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. like you're destroying an entire country, so we'll destroy the the rest of the world. It's just when it comes to nuclear war, there is no such thing as winning. There is no human being on the earth that should have the power to destroy the earth. I, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. You well, know? destroy the people. I mean, technically, the earth will, will be better in a, a couple thousand years. Sure, yes. It'll years. shake off the, the virus <laughs> then, of humanity. And then the dolphins become intelligent and take over everything. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm just saying is that it's, it's, it's ridiculous to have the power of one person be able to destroy 8 billion lives. Yes. Like, and that it, doesn't make any sense. Look, the fact that Donald Trump I know. had the capacity to destroy the world, and he probably would have done it if somebody would have, you know, if, if, if Russia would have people, hurt his feelings. Well, he would have made the order, but I, I think there would have been people like Popov or whatever his name was that would have been like, yeah, I'm not doing that. That's why you surround yourself with sycophants. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's, that's the scariest part is somebody, you know, it, it, the scariest part is somebody like Vladimir Putin. Yeah, yeah. Who, yeah. you know... For all intents and purposes, from what I've heard, is dying of cancer. Yeah. And so, what does he care? Yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't matter. You know, what does he care if his last uh, act of humanity is nuking Ukraine? I, it would be absolutely ridiculous if he were to nuke anybody. I don't think uh, that the Russian proletariat. I don't think the Russian generals or the. I don't think the Russian military would do it. I don't think so either. Especially yeah. if he was dying, and it was just. I'm sure there are some. You know, diehard weirdos, just like we of got course, diehard weirdos course, over here. But I would hope that there would be enough sanity yeah, that it would stop that. I would hope and so, that's, too. That's, <laughs> that's basically we've just been hinging upon sanity and people doing the right thing for the last <laughs> six. <laughs> Hoping and praying. 80 years. 80 years. Yeah. 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 Meyer... Papazian, Hume, and several casting directors spent most of July 1982 taking numerous trips to Kansas City. In between casting in Los Angeles, where they relied mostly on unknowns, they would fly to the Kansas City area to interview local actors and scenery. They were hoping to find some real Midwesterners for the smaller roles. Hollywood casting directors strolled through shopping malls in Kansas City to look for local people to fill small and supporting roles, and the Daily Newspaper and Lawrence ran an advertisement calling for local residents of all ages to sign up for jobs as many extras in the film. And a professor of theater and film at the University of Kansas was hired to head up the local casting of the movie. Nice. You know, he got a big head. Oh, yeah. Well, and they needed so many people, man. That last shot in the... the or not last shot. But shot in the gymnasium? The gymnasium yeah. shot near the end of the movie where there's just like a thousand people all dying. It's like, oh, man. Oh, yeah. So funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the 80 or so speaking parts, only 15 were cast in Los Angeles. The remaining roles were filled in Kansas City and Lawrence. Nice. I wonder if any of them Kansas City guys got the bug and went to Hollywood. I probably. Make I mean, it big. I mean, I did. Honestly, except for Jason Robards and a couple other people I recognized, you know, from later roles, like most of them I didn't know. Yeah. And they could have been from Kansas City. And I was like, hey, most of them are really good. Like, yeah. they're decent actors. Uh, so some of the established cast includes George Ann Johnson as Helen Oaks, Jason Robards' char- 
character's wife. She was so good. Um, a native of Decorah, Iowa, Johnson had roles in Shortcut to Hell in 1957, the only directing effort from James Cagney. Yeah, she, man. Yeah. I'm going to direct you, she. I want you to do this, she. You got to go over there, and you got to go over there, she. And then you're going to say this, see, And then you see it real good, see. All right, cut. <laughs> Midnight Cowboy in 1969 with Dustin Hoffman and John Voight. Yeah. Such I'm walking over here. That's such a great movie. Yeah, that's my perfect impersonation. That was perfect. I am going to walking over here. I am here. going to walk in here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frank Weiler in 1973. Mm, not a cumbersome title at all. No, it's uh, based on a children's book, surprisingly, and starring Ingrid, Ingrid Bergman. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, Health in 1980, the ensemble film from Robert Altman, also starring Carol Burnett, James Garner, and Lauren Bacall, along with like 40 other people. Interesting. Uh, after the day after, Johnson would appear in The Slugger's Wife in 1985, written by Neil Simon and directed by Hal Ashby. Nice. I almost thought that After the Day After was the sequel to The Day After. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was The Day After Tomorrow, no, no. which is starring Jake Gyllenhaal. But they yeah. should make After the Day After. After the Day After? That's called yeah. Fallout, yeah, the fun. video game. The video game, yeah. Murphy's Romance in 1985, starring Fally, F- what, Fally Field? Fally Field. <laughs> Murphy's Romance in 1985, starring Sally Field and James Garner. That's a good one. It's James Garner. It's a fun movie. Yeah. Yeah. And Quicksilver in 1986, the Kevin Bacon film about bicycle messengers in New York. I love that movie. I, I know. Love it. it is one of my guilty pleasures. It is so good. It is so good. Kevin Bacon is just the most underrated actor of all actors. 100% agree. Every, I, it, I'm with him, man. I understand his frustration about yeah. not getting hits yeah. and not being a bigger star than he is because he deserved it. He is so good. Yeah. I, I, everything he's in is so pleasurable. Even to watch. the EV commercial with his daughter, where he's pretending yeah. to be socially conscious or whatever. He's oh, hilarious. I know. He's great. He's great. He's just so good. Uh, Joe Beth Williams was cast as Nurse Nancy Bauer. Uh, Williams appeared in Stir Crazy in 1980, starring Gene Wilder and Richard Pryor. Playing their lawyer. Yeah. Poltergeist in 1982, directed by Toby Hooper and produced by Steven Spielberg, or ghost directed by Steven Spielberg. Mm, no, because he was a ghost. <laughs> he killed himself. And then directed it as a ghost, and then they brought him back to life. Nice. It was really cool. People don't talk about that very much. No. Joe Beth Williams smoked pot with her husband, Craig T. Nelson. Did. They were a cool, cool Yeah, they were cool parents. parents. They were cool parents. Well, that's what happened, Adam. Because they were smoking the devil's lettuce, that's why all the... That's why they came back. All the Native Americans, the indigenous peoples, came out of the ground and haunted them because they were smoking the wacky tobacco. I smell weed. (laughs) Let's get them. (laughs) <laughs> the Big Chill in 1983, directed by Lawrence Kasdan. Again, with Joe Yeah, Beth with Williams. Kevin Bacon and... Yeah, that was Joe Beth Williams. Ke- Kevin Bacon wasn't in... Oh, wasn't he? No. no I'm thinking of Kevin Klein. Kevin Klein. Oh, sorry. Not Kevin Bacon. Kevin Klein. Uh, the Big Chill. I've not seen The Big Chill in a long time. <sighs> yeah, I... <sighs> We're going to have to do You love that it. movie. It's another Lawrence Kasdan movie that I can't stand. <laughs> Lawrence Kasdan. Better than Grand Canyon. I don't... Ugh, anything is better than Grand Canyon. Well. Eating a big old... Poop sandwich nope, is better no, than watching. No, I would Grand disagree Canyon. with that. <laughs> well, it depends on the poop. Look, Grand Canyon's garb. Okay. And uh, yes. Anyway, <laughs> we give more talk. I would Grand rather be Canyon. in a nuclear <laughs> <laughs> holocaust than watch Grand Canyon again. <laughs> I'd rather have my teeth fall out from radiation. Yeah. My hair awful, my, awful. My skin slough off. Oh, it's so gross. Uh, a three-time Emmy Award nominee, she was nominated for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Miniseries or a Movie for her work in the TV movie Adam in 1983. That was all about you. It was. I was five. Uh, and she played me. It's surprising. <laughs> she was so good <laughs> as you. And the TV miniseries Baby M in 1988. That was also about you. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. Her third nomination was for her guest role in the sitcom Frasier. Oh, my God. Yeah. Joe Beth Williams. Technically, she was the one that he should have been with. I should be with you. Uh, it was over. It was over a uh, um, uh, like an end of season thing where right. he took her to like the Virgin Islands or something, but then he couldn't get somebody else out of his head. And he, was, he was an idiot. I'm an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Fraser's coming back though, so yay. Maybe they'll bring back Joe Beth Williams. Yeah, that would be nice. It would be. I haven't uh, seen her in a while. Uh, her directorial debut with a 1994 short film on Hope earned her an Academy Award nomination for Best Live Action Short Film. That's awesome. That is great. And in 2009, she began serving as president of the Screen Actors Guild Foundation. She is president emeritus of the foundation. She's awesome. I've always been a fan of hers. She's great. She yeah. was great in Teachers with Nick Nolte. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. She was great. Yeah. I'm a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> that was all, literally all his lines yeah. in the whole movie. No teacher. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Nolte, what does this mean? Uh, I'm a teacher. Okay, thanks. Um, two plus two is four. 
<laughs> John Cullum was cast as Jim Dahlberg. Uh, Cullum is an established sta- stage actor, having won two Tony Awards and being nominated three more times. He is a great actor. Fantastic. And uh, and he's got that look, man. He's, oh, yeah. He's got yeah. such a... He was so perfect for this part, by the he's, way. He is the Midwestern dad. Because he's also the nice, the sweet Midwestern... Yes. Mis- he's the sweet Midwestern dad that has to change to protect his family and he adapts so well like yeah. he is the one person in the movie that is like all right i'm gonna make a sh- fallout shelter down in the in the basement yeah, he was like, ready i'm i'm gonna do this he was ready uh notable roles for Colum are tavern owner hauling vincour in the television drama series northern exposure gaining an emmy award nomination for best supporting actor in a drama yeah i was a bar owner Married a girl who was 40 years younger than me, but we had a good relationship. That was the twist. Yeah. I, I really love Northern Exposure. Oh, everybody did. It was did. one of those I watched with my mom. It I was, was great. Uh, my friend Sean, that was his favorite show, and we would watch that. Oh, really? Time. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it was a great show. It was, it, was, it was written really well. It was one of those quirky, different shows that came out of nowhere and everybody really right. liked and that people have been trying to copy it ever yeah. since. <laughs> That's true. He was featured in 15 episodes of the NBC television series ER as Mark Green's father. He was great. Anthony Edwards played Mark Green and he was really good as his dad. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, Green Anthony ended Edwards up dying of like a brain... Yeah, he did eventually uh, die from... Tumor Tumor, or yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, spoiler alert. <laughs> for a 30-year-old show. <laughs> for a show that was on the air for 30 years that's been off the if air for 30 years. Yeah. Sorry if you haven't uh, delved into your ER binge. Highly recommend, though. It's a great show. Oh, amazing. Uh, he has had multiple guest appearances on Law & Order and Law & Special Victims Unit as attorney and now Judge Barry Mordock. He's so good on that, too. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I am a... SVU fanatic. I love that he started on Law and Order as an attorney, and then they brought him back for SVU, and he's like, no, you're a judge now. Well, what's really great about it is he's one of the only people that, that his character kind of carried over. Most right, people, right. it would be like, well, he started out as a rapist, and now he's a judge. <laughs> but it's, and they're like, what? And it's right, like, well, not right. the same character. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, Steve Gutenberg was cast as Stephen Klein. The Goot! Oh, the Goot. Gutenberg gained his first credit role in the CBS television movie Something for Joey in 1977, starring Mark Singer. Yeah, you know what Something for Joey was? Uh, no. Yeah, it was. Oh, God, okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. No, I don't, I don't know what it was. <laughs> I don't know what it was either. <laughs> I'm sure we could probably find Something for Joey on YouTube yeah, because but it was, all those TV movies are You on. know it wasn't something good. Uh, you no, know that it was they, a TV movie. Yeah. They made it into a TV movie. It's going to be something. Something bad was coming for Joey. There should have been something bad for Joey. <laughs> I think that's, it. that's just implied. Yeah, of course. Gutenberg scored his first lead role in the TV movie To Race the Wind in 1980, playing blind law- lawyer Harold Krentz. I remember that. Uh, to Race the Wind. That was always the big thing back then, was playing a blind person. It was. That was, that was when you got your street cred. Was oh, yeah, you yeah. Played a blind yeah, person. it was like in uh, in Little House on the Prairie when one of the lead actors went blind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was like, everybody was, have you ever played blind? Do you ever do a part where you play blind? No. I don't. Well, I mean, kind of. I was blindfolded, but like technically he was blind. Yeah. It's always fun to do blind because then you just kind of unfocus was, your eyes. And that was uh, that was the play where I appeared naked on stage yeah. except for the blindfold, and it definitely helped. Yeah, we all knew it was you, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you yeah. were great. You were great in that. Oh, thanks. That same year, he started the Nancy Walker-directed Can't Stop the Music, a semi-autobiographical movie about the disco group Village People. Yeah, he played the cop. Did he? I don't know. <laughs> he but looks like he should I gotta have played be the honest. Cop. I gotta be honest. I kind of want to see this. I didn't know this existed. Well, you know, it's not going to delve into the trueness I, of. Well, there's something for Joey. <laughs> <laughs> in, in 1982, he appeared in Barry Levinson's Diner. Oh God! If you have not seen Diner, get it now. It is not only his best performance because he's amazing in it. But also Mickey Rourke's best performance. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, Paul Reiser, his best performance. And uh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. But it's such a good movie. It's so funny yeah. because it's a lot of these guys' first movie. Oh, yeah. And it's also the best one they've ever done. Okay. <laughs> I, I always really liked Steve Gutenberg. I always thought that he probably could have transitioned into more like drama and more serious stuff. Yeah. Except for the fact that after the day after 1904, he played the lead role in Police Academy. And he was then typecast. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, 
The first Police Academy is great. Yeah. It is a funny, great movie. It and did, he's great and in it. And it did really well. It grossed uh, $8.5 million in its opening weekend and over $149 million worldwide off of a budget of $4.5 million. He did the Chevy Chase, smartass, yeah. above it all character yeah. very well. He did. He did. And you're right. I'm sure he was probably him. easier to work with as well. Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, when he got to little men and a little man and a baby, <laughs> little men and a baby, <laughs> three men and a baby. <laughs> um, All right, <laughs> that was a different character. That he was, wasn't playing. He wasn't the smartest. That smart was, ass. yeah, yeah. I he mean, was, he, wasn't he a cartoonist in that? Like, yeah, he was an animator uh, or a car- yeah, cartoonist. Cartoonist, yeah. Um, but he was a sweeter guy. And then he's he's pivoted from being the leading yeah. man to a good character actor. I've always loved the Goot. He got yeah. a bad rap. Because he was in crap. It was because of the Police Academy sequels. Oh, if yeah. they hadn't happened, he would have had a much more prominent career. And the truth is, he was only in like two of them. I know. He wasn't in all 18. I know. It was pretty much Bobcat Goldthwait that took he over gave the... Up after. I'm sure they paid him a lot of money for the second movie. I think by the end, the leaves were Bubba Smith and Bobcat Goldthwait. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, Michael... Michael Winslow. Winslow. Yeah. <laughs> It was literally just 90% of it was just him doing sound effects. Yeah. Woo, wee. He actually, Michael Winslow would actually come into the screenings and do them live. Right, he did. Yeah. And nobody asked him to either. No, he just did. Weird. <laughs> he just did it. You know, he came back and was on America's Got Talent. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's still super it. talented. The guy is extremely talented. That's his a, stand-up. another guy who should have had a much bigger career. Oh, yeah. And his stand-up was really funny because it wasn't just the sound effects. Right, I mean, right. that was the... You know, that yeah. was the draw and the centerpiece, but he was still just a really funny, funny man. It's it's just like Carrot Top. People think he's just about props, but he's actually also he's about, just about props. <laughs> well, no, he's also no, about no, he's, creatine and steroids no, now, and yes. working out and looking completely bizarre. <laughs> looking like an old lady. <laughs> There's, look, Carrot Top I, is pretty actually, funny. Actually, to be honest, I loved Carrot Top. Everybody did. He hit it just the right time. Yeah. I was just the right age, and his props were brilliant. He's another guy. That gets a horrible rap for know, whatever reason. He apparently is a really nice guy. I, I'm from sure. Wherever, and he's a funny, talented dude, too. And he's also in on the joke. He knows. Yeah, he makes fun yeah. of himself. He's not, you know, he's not a Scott Bayo. No, 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 no. And he's doing really well. He has shows in Vegas that are booked, like, all year round. Not Scott like, Bayo. No, not Scott Bayo. <laughs> Although he's going to be moving there soon. He's moving uh, to Florida. So, yeah, uh, whatever. How is that news, by the way? Sorry for the speed bump, <laughs> but, like, there was, like, eight articles about, oh, Scott Bayo's moving out of California. Like, who effing cares? The guy hasn't done anything since yeah. Charles was charged 30 years ago. I mean, I know a bunch of people that moved out, too, and it wasn't newsworthy then. The headline should have been, angry, <laughs> angry, disenfranchised white male, feels neglected, moves from California to Florida, where he can be mean. Also named Scott Bayo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Who? Huh? Okay. Anyway, uh, Gutenberg became very busy uh, over the next four years, appearing in nine starring roles, tying with Gene Hackman for the busiest actor at that time. Oh, yeah, man. He he was on top of the world. Some of those include Cocoon in 1985. Cocoon. Which I honestly, I we on the cruise we were on a few months ago, I watched part of it uh, in, the, in my stateroom. Totally forgot he was in it. <laughs> really? I always think about the older guys. I always forget that he's the like the younger dude yeah. finding the thing. He, I, he's got yeah. the love story with the alien lady. Yeah, yeah. When they go to the poo. That's a, such a great movie. It's a great too. movie. It is a great movie. What's horrifying is that a lot of the actors playing the really old people were my age. Correct. And, that <laughs> and a little younger. Me. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's really funny. Uh, yeah. Short Circuit in 1986, uh, which was a fantastic movie. Number five is alive. Yeah. Which they, that's the first time where I realized, and I was like seven or eight, the first time I realized that trailers were liars because they said it in the trailer and he didn't say it until the last 10 seconds of the movie and it drove me insane. Poor Fisher Stevens. That movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. I I'd lo- I'd love Fisher Stevens. I adore Fisher Stevens. He's not only a great actor, he's a great director, but unfortunately, he, uh, that role did not age well for him. No, no, it did not. Uh, he, Gutenberg also did Three Men and a Baby in 1987, or Little Men and a Baby. <laughs> Little <laughs> Men and a Baby. How you look at it, which is also uh, one of my guilty pleasures. Like, I love that movie There's so no much. guilt involved. That's a great movie. It's such a great movie. Three Men and a Little Lady isn't bad either, but Three Men and a Baby is a, is a good comedy. It's a great comedy. And thank yeah. you, Leonard Nimoy. Yeah, he's a brilliant director. 
He most recently can be seen making guest appearances on The Goldbergs and in the TV movie How to Murder Your Husband, the Nancy Brophy story as the husband who is murdered. Nice. Yeah, he was great on The Goldbergs. The Goldbergs was great for four seasons, and then they yeah. should have stopped. But uh, but he was really didn't he play the uncle or something? No, he was a uh, he was like a, a teacher. He was like yes. a teacher professor. He was, he was like, like a science, science teacher. Dirty yes. teacher. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. he was so good. And he's like he's so watching the goot yeah. in uh, the day after. Just crazy curly hair that's so oh. thick it looks like a wig, and he's like a skinny little in shape guy, handsome, handsome. And now, yeah. man, time is not kind of... No, it. no, it has not. But he's still great. I mean, he still does great work. Oh, he does. Everybody loves the goot. John Lithgow was cast as Joe Huxley. Yeah, I'm just Huxley. I'm not saying Joe Huxley. I'm... <laughs> so, I, I, I felt so bad because I turned to Jim during the movie, and I was like, you know, John Lithgow is one of those people that got better looking as he aged. He did. Well, he's he a weird... kind of weird looking. He's got very uh, sharp features. Yeah, his head is kind of like triangular. Yeah, like it it and comes pointy. down to a point yeah. too much. And when he got older, it kind of well, you get to, your face fills up a bit. Yeah, yeah. You, you you gain you, the the beauty of getting older is you get fat. Yeah, or you get super or skinny, fatter for some people. <laughs> yes, yeah, well, woo baby. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just in sometimes it, it it yeah. There are guys that look weird when they're young. Yeah, and look better when they're older. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't happen to a lot. It's and usually it'll end up happening the opposite, where you, right. they get older and then they start to look like old ladies, like um, Aerosmith guy. Oh, uh, Steven uh, Tyler. Steven Tyler, yeah. Who, again, if you see pictures of Steven Tyler and Mickey Rourke together, they look like two old ladies well, like going to a knitting circle. They do, but Mickey Rourke did it to himself with insane amounts of plastic yes. surgery. He looks like the lion lady. I know, I know. It's creepy, yeah. I feel so badly for these people that keep getting this work done. It's not helping. No, and it's just sad that you feel like you have to. Yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. In 1972, Lithgow made his film debut in Dealing, or the Berkeley to Boston 40 Brick Lost Bag Blues, starring Robert F. Lyons and Barbara Hershey, based on the 1970 book by Michael and Douglas Creighton. Again, not a very cumbersome title at all. Uh, yeah, this book uh, was actually written by, uh, it was it was a, a, technically a pseudonym by Michael and Douglas Crichton, which they called Michael Douglas, which I thought was really funny. It is funny. But it's about how they used to deal drugs in college. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm not surprised. I think that's how Michael Crichton got through college, was dealing drugs. Hey, it's, a lot of people got through college by dealing drugs. And it was, let's, which it was drugs? You yeah. know, if it was pot, who cares? I'm sure it was pot. I don't think it was more. And if it was, you know, it, 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 as long as it wasn't heroin. But I hope not. I hope I mean, not. And cocaine is a little iffy. Yeah. Three days after the day after aired, Lithgow appeared in Terms of Endearment, written and directed by James L. Brooks, based on the Larry McMurtry novel and co-starring Deborah Winger, Shirley MacLaine, Jack Nicholson, Danny DeVito, and Jeff Daniels. You got your Terms of Endearment. That's I, what that's that's what I remember from it. Jack I Nicholson. I don't remember Lithgow being in this movie. So, and granted, I've, I only saw it once, and it was a long time ago. But I did not recall him being in this movie. Over his career, Lithgow has received two Tony Awards, six Emmy Awards, two Golden Globe Awards, three Screen Actor Guild Awards, an American Comedy Award, four Drama Desk Awards, and also has been nominated for two Academy Awards and four Grammy Awards. All well deserved. The guy's a genius. Have you ever seen The World According to Garp? Yes. With Rob Williams. One of my favorite yes. books. Lithgow played one of the first trans characters. Like, uh, oh, yeah. you know. A ha oh, yeah. His yeah, yeah, yeah. character right. was a woman who used to be a football player mm -hmm. and then transitioned and had the surgery and transitioned oh, wow. into a woman and lived with his mom. And his mom was like this ultra feminist who had all these, you know, women that cut their tongues out, this whole oh, wow. sub story and everything. But he, the, the character that he played was so compassionate. So defined. I think he was nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised. For it. Yeah. But it was a very graceful portrayal of a trans woman yeah. when people didn't really have any idea what a trans woman was. Right, you know? right. So kudos to him. Yeah. Uh, he's received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and he was inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame, and he was elected to the American Philosophical Society in 2019. It just seems very appropriate. Yeah. I, I just could see him being a philosophical. Oh, gent. yes. Yes, completely. In June 2019, Lithgow portrayed Donald Trump in the investigation of Search for Truth in 10X, a live reading of special counsel Robert Mueller's report on Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. Interesting. Staged on the altar of New York City's Riverside Church, the reading was created by playwright Robert Schenken and narrated by Annette Benning. 
Excellent. It also featured Kevin Klein as Mueller, Joel Gray as Jeff Sessions, Jason Alexander as Chris Christie, and Alfre Woodard as Hope Hicks. <laughs> this is a reading I would have loved to have seen. Yeah, it would have put a little life into that report, that's for sure. <laughs> Lithgow can most recently be seen in The Old Man, starring Jeff Bridges, and in the upcoming Scorsese film Killers of the Flower Moon. That looks really good. Yeah, it does. Uh, I still haven't watched The Old Man. I am curious to see it, but uh, I've heard it gets a little boring after a while. The Which? Old man, the Old Man. Yeah, I started watching it, and I didn't finish it. I should. Because I love Jeff Bridges, and John and Lithgow John is Lithgow, absolutely yeah. incredible in it. I mean, John Lithgow is incredible in everything that he does. The guy has yeah. never given a bad performance, right? ever, right. in my opinion. Wayne Knight was cast as Man in Hospital. Uh, Wayne Knight might have actually been one of those from Kansas City that moved out to Hollywood afterwards. I don't remember him. I don't remember seeing him. The funny thing is, I think he was really skinny. <laughs> so I think that's part of the reason why we, he wasn't recognizable. Uh, Knight is most well known for playing Newman in the sitcom Seinfeld and as Nedry in the original Jurassic Park. Hello, Newman. Uh, the Day After was his first credited role in film or TV. Ugh, whenever I see him, I think of, ah, ah, ah. Oh, I know. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. From Jurassic Park. Yeah. His first credited film role was as Stan in Dirty Dancing. Yeah, he was. Uh, Everybody remembers Stan. Actually, the funny thing is that I was like, oh, that's right. He wasn't Dirty Dancing. I do Dancing. remember him, too. <laughs> was, it but it's not the, the first thing I think of when I think of Dirty Dancing. Really? It is. I always think Wayne Knight. No, I always... Actually, to be honest, I always think of the soundtrack. I had nice. the soundtrack as a kid, and I listened to it a lot. Oh, the jam of my love. I would, honestly, oh, my favorite song on it was... Uh, that's something uh, something in the wind or something about it's the song that Patrick Swayze sang. It was really good. Yeah. All right. He's got a great voice. Okay. Easy. Why do you hate Patrick Swayze? I don't. I used to run into him all the time. He was very nice. Very yeah. short man, but yeah, very nice. He was a very nice man. Knight does a ton of voice work now, but can most recently be seen in the supernatural teen comedy Darby and the Dead, released in 2022. I didn't see that one. Um. Yeah, no, I don't think anybody did. Uh, but... It was, uh, there was a, a lot more actors, like uh, Arliss Howard I didn't talk about, who was in Full Metal Jacket, mm-hmm. uh, the thing I always remember him from, and, uh, and a few others. But there were so many people in this yeah. movie, it was hard to narrow it down. Yeah, there was a lot of people that you would recognize. Yeah. While in Kansas City, Meyer and Papazian toured the Federal Emergency Management Agency offices. Uh, when asked about its plan for surviving nuclear war, a FEMA official replied that it was experimenting with putting evacuation instructions in telephone books in New England. In about six years, everyone should have them. That meeting led Meyer to later refer to FEMA as... A complete joke. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, instructions in six years is not going to help you if the war happens tomorrow. Get the phone book, honey. We got to figure out what to do. (laughs) It was during that time that decision was made to change Hampton in the script to Lawrence. You know what it said in the phone book? What did it say? It said, uh, good luck. Yeah, it actually, the instructions were to put the phone book over your head. Right. And if you don't have extra phone books, kick all the family members out of the house and let them deal with the radiation. Use the phone book to beat yourself to death before the bombs come, and then <laughs> you, you won't, you'll you be beat saved. Your, beat your family to death, yes. and then use it to protect yourself. There you go. You take the pages out and cover them like newspaper, so that way no radiation comes in. Look, it was very, it was going to be a good plan. Yeah, they lead-lined all the pages of, phone books were super heavy back then. They just need, oh, they were huge. <laughs> they weighed about 400 pounds. They were huge. It was always the worst time because it around the time when I was helping, I never had a paper route, but I had a friend who had a paper route. It was around that time when they would always ask the newspaper kids to help deliver the phone books. Oh yeah, and I always was like, hell no. They used to beat prisoners with phone books. Oh yeah, because it would leave uh, bruises. bruises. Yeah, yeah, but it would leave a lot of pain. Yeah, and really tough guys would tear them in half. But that was the thing back in the day before, uh, bef- when you first moved to LA. The two things that you kept in your car was a Thomas Guide and a phone book. Oh, yeah. You had to. And then you weren't using your phone in your car for the phone book. You were running to a pay phone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah throw in all those, num- all those coins. Yeah. <laughs> That's me putting the Literally, coins nobody knows what you're doing right now. Well, <laughs> because no one's right used a pay do. phone in 30 years. <laughs> God, I remember. I, it was like I'd be in a drug dealer when I worked for ILM. I'd get the beep. And have to oh, find yeah. a pay phone. You pull over. You got to jump to the phone. And it was crazy, man. Yeah, yeah. There was so much. Oh, God. Uh, so it was during that time that decision was made to change Hampton in the script to Lawrence. Meyer and Hume figured since Lawrence was a real town, it would be more believable. Yay! We get to be the real nuclear killer, too. We all get to die for radiation Yay! poisoning. 
The town boasted a socio-cultural mix, sat near the exact geographic center of the continental U.S., and was a prime missile target, according to Hume and Meyer's research, because 150 Minuteman missile silos stood nearby. That's crazy. That's the part that was just so insane, was the woman that lived right next to a missile silo. Literally waving at yeah. the, the guy who was showing up and like, hey, how's it going? Hey, neighbor. Didn't look too happy to see him. No. Well, no. Uh, that was also, the the to me, more so than the... Uh, I didn't say more so than the destruction sequence, but like the fact that once you see those missiles take off, you know, you knew that was it. It it's was it. like, you got right. like maybe 20 minutes. Yeah. Until, and, and what, and then I, 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 I haven't thought a lot about it, yeah. but I've often thought like if there were, what do you do for that last 20 minutes? I don't know. I don't know. Um, go find your loved ones and hug them. Go find the person you hate the most and kill him. Well, that's what I would do. Shove them outside with your phone book. <laughs> yeah. No, I wouldn't hurt anybody, but I would probably, I don't know, get a good bottle of scotch or something, I suppose. I would do something. Sit yeah. on the roof. I mean, maybe smoke out, a cigar. Out break out those illicit drugs I've been hiding for a while. Yeah, well, I got them, so they're gone. <laughs> uh, so Lawrence had some great locations, and its people were more supportive of the project. And suddenly, less emphasis was put on Kansas City. This d- decision was made to have the city annihilated in the script, and Lawrence was made the primary location in the film. Makes total sense. Um, yeah, it was horrifying. The one character that we knew, we met... That gets fried was Jason Robard's daughter. Yeah, like the first person that turns into a skeleton and vaporizes was the daughter. I was like, oh man, that's and sucks. his wife. We didn't yeah. see it, but his no. wife got vaporized. Yeah. yeah, ABC originally planned to air the day after as a four-hour television event that would be spread over two nights with a total running time of 180 minutes without commercials. Yeah, they wanted to torture the ass out of the American public. I I can imagine the beginning would have been, like, leading up to the missiles, and then the the second night would have been everything else. Yeah, probably. Which would have just been... I, it just, I don't think it would have worked as well. No. Yeah. It would have been too long. That's the yeah. thing, is you... We spent... It's going to sound effed up, but we spent just enough time in that miserable existence... Yeah, yeah. ...to make its point. Right. And right, not to right. belabor the point or be gratuitous. Gratuitous. Right, 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 right. right. Meyer felt the original script was padded and suggested cutting out an hour of material to present the whole film in one night. The network stuck with its two-night broadcast plan, and Meyer filmed the entire three-hour script as evidenced by a 172-minute work print that has recently surfaced. Yeah, that's a lot. I I had said at the beginning we were watching, I was like, oh, I kind of want to watch that. And after watching the movie, I don't want to watch that. (laughs) No, I don't need more. Uh, Also... Why would they want two nights if they weren't going to run commercials? It doesn't seem like it was going to make any money. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they ran commercials. They did up they until did. The, the 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 nuke. Nukes, but yeah. Uh, subsequently, the network found that it was difficult to find advertisers because of the subject matter. So ABC relented and allowed Meyer to edit the film for a one night broadcast version. Meyer's original single night cut ran two hours and twenty minutes, which he presented to the network. After that screening, many executives were deeply moved and some even cried, which led Meyer to believe they approved of his cut. It was really good. Uh, However, a further six-month struggle ensued over the final shape of the film. Network censors had opinions about the inclusion of specific scenes, and ABC itself was eventually intent on... Trimming the film to the bone. And made demands to cut out many scenes that Meyer strongly lobbied to keep. Meyer and his editor, Bill Dornish, refused to make cuts, and then Dornish was fired, and Meyer walked away from the project. Good for them. Yeah. I mean, not for getting fired, but good for Dornan for running away from... Good for him for leaving the project for after the guy was fired. Having the integrity. Yeah. yeah. ABC brought in other editors, but the network ultimately was not happy with the results they produced. This reminds me of every client I've ever worked for, ever. <laughs> it finally brought Meyer back and reached a compromise, with Meyer cutting down the film to a final running time of 120 minutes. Yeah, I also, with the advertising, you know, it's yeah. like, nobody wants to be, you know, they, they're they in the hospital, faces falling off, people are dying, yeah. cut to Twinkies, the I snack know, for I know. America Today, you know, nobody wants to. It was, it was like during the lockdown when the, the COVID was really bad, and then they would just, it would, CNN was like, 100,000 people died, and they would cut to like an Applebee's commercial. <laughs> it's like, ugh. <laughs> it's not, it's a bad look. Yeah, it is. it's not good. And then nobody won, you know. McDonald's doesn't want to be, no, like, well, you that's, know, associated assume, with nuclear annihilation. I assume that's why, they probably had the initial thought of like, oh, well, we'll, we'll only have you know, advertisements in the beginning or whatever. But then even then people are like, I don't know, man. Yeah. Like that's. Well, it's just, yeah, there, there was no way. There's no way to, to show this with commercials. No, no, 
No. The Day After was initially scheduled to premiere on ABC in May 1983, but the post-production work to reduce the film's length pushed it back its initial air date to November. Censors forced ABC to cut an entire scene of a child having a nightmare about nuclear holocaust and then sitting up screaming. Yeah. Uh, which is in the version that we watched, which is on YouTube. The best HD version is the one where she... It's like the jump scare where she suddenly pops up. But that's not... That's a different child popping up because there was, there was the child oh, having the there? nightmare. That was before... The actual dropping of the bombs, that oh. scene, oh. with the kid jumping up because he was having a nightmare about it. Oh. I don't know if they put that back in, but the, there was a second one of the kid jumping up that was all effed up in the face. Yeah, yeah, in the hospital. And that yeah. was the jump scare that they made them cut out. Yeah, psychiatrist told ABC it would disturb children. Meyer said, This strikes me as ludicrous, not only in relation to the rest of the film, but also when contrasted with the huge doses of violence to be found on any average evening of TV viewing. I mean, he's, he's right. Yes, of course he's right. It's just, it's, censors, a lot of times, censors just need to justify their work, and they over-censorize, especially back then. It was always erring on the side of, of yeah, yeah. the advertisers. Yeah, so a few more cuts were made, including a scene in which Denise possesses a diaphragm, which was put back in in the version that we saw. Yeah, I mean, that's a long scene of her chasing around her chasing little sister her who sister steals her diaphragm. Steals it. It's so gross. gross. Another scene in... Another scene in which a hospital patient abruptly sits up screaming was excised from the original television broadcast, but restored for home video releases. That's the one. Yeah, so the one we saw must have been the home video release. Yeah. Uh, Meyer persuaded ABC to dedicate the film to the citizens of Lawrence and also to put a disclaimer at the end of the film after the credits to let the viewer know that the day after downplayed the true effects of nuclear war so it could have a story. Oh, yeah. It, it was very sanitized. Yes. Because they didn't show people vomiting blood. And yes. crying blood, and the you know their their effing skin just sloughing off their bodies. If you want to see an actual realistic portrayal of radiation sickness, watch the miniseries Chernobyl. Yeah, there is an entire episode, which is one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. But it is it is just absolutely horrifying. Or also watch you know any documentary about Hiroshima if you want to see the true sure you know actual yeah. effects of an A bomb. I mean, it's just yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not pretty. It, and it's, 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 uh, I'm looking for a word that does it justice. It's inhuman. I mean, you're literally melting from the inside. Yeah, it is the most destructive. <sighs> Oppenheimer never got over the fact yeah. of what he did. I know, I know. And he knew that he had changed the world. For the worse, yeah, forever, yeah. and I can't imagine being the person responsible for giving the possibility of the world's annihilation in yeah. just the press of a button in such a nonchalant, in such a dispassionate way. Right, you right. turn two keys and you press a button. Yeah, and that's how you end the world. Yeah, I mean, it's it is. It's scary, man, it's scary. if you think about it. I mean, in, and this is what we were living through all the time back during the Cold War. It was always on the backs of our mind, you know? Sure, that, sure. That, that we were going to get nuked or that we were going to nuke. And the irony, the ironing is, is that now we're, we were the closest we've ever been on the nuclear clock to, to, to annihilation. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, we were like... <laughs> like 20 minutes yeah, further yeah. away back then. Yeah, yeah. And that's what's even scarier, is it is still a possibility, people. Yeah, of course. Yes, that's what I said at the beginning. It's still, I mean, technically, nothing's changed. No. There's still that possibility. They're still out there. As we said, it's actually worse now. Yeah. There's actually more of a possibility of a nuclear war. Yeah. Or, or nuclear weapons being used. Right, right. The day after received a large promotional campaign prior to its broadcast. Commercials aired several months in advance, and ABC distributed half a million viewers' guides that discussed the dangers of nuclear war and prepared the viewer for the graphic scenes of mushroom clouds and radiation burn victims. Discussion groups were also formed nationwide. Yeah, it was It was also, you know, because the, of the time, we only had like three stations, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So ABC, NBC, CBS were big deals. And this kind of stuff, they really, they made things into an event, and, and to the point where, like you said, there would be 
things in the newspaper that you would pull out as guides or yeah you know yeah i mean in this especially i mean just because of the the nature of the subject but it's it's well, because yeah. seen this before no no n- not at all and 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 not in such a frank and in a way that isn't the Omega Man or something that has you I mean, know, ev- your initial hero. Everybody and- was having nightmares about nuclear holocaust, and this was putting images to that nightmare. Sure. And, and I, yeah, I can imagine why people would want to talk about it. And, you know, I mean, we still should be talking about it. Well, it's the elephant in the room, you know? It's like people are, are hate to talk about the stuff that is the most dangerous because, of course. you know, it scares them. But it's like you got to talk about this stuff because it's it could happen. Yeah. The more you talk about it, the less likely it is to happen. Exactly. And, and... By portraying it as realistically as possible, and you don't sugarcoat it, right. and you don't make it a rah-rah 80s America triumph thing, you know, like, we beat Russia. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it shows you just, it just shows you that there are no winners and losers. There's just no, losers no. in this. Everybody loses. And the whole earth loses. Yeah. You know, and, and whoever is left behind to survive, they don't, that's not the... It, they they got last the place. Yeah. They lost, <laughs> you know? Yeah. On its original broadcast on Sunday, November 20th, 1983, John Cullum warned viewers before the film was premiered that the film contains graphic and disturbing scenes and encouraged parents who had young children watching to watch together and discuss the issues of nuclear warfare. Hi, everybody. John I mean, Cullum here. Perfect person to do it. I just want to tell you, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a rough watch. You're going to want to keep your children close, keep them cuddled, and then tell them, if it happens, just run towards the blast. It's, I, during that destruction scene, I've seen this movie a number of times. And during the destruction scene, still, just like your heart stops. Yeah. It's like, oh, oh, God. Because, and we were talking about this too. The movie does the Stephen King. Yeah, yeah. Which is the brilliant way of setting up a story by just this idyllic life. Mm-hmm. This small town idyllic life. Cullum's daughter's going to get married. She's running around with a diaphragm, you know, having premarital, <laughs> having sex, premarital. They understand, you know, yeah, and the son's yeah. a good boy who helps his dad, and the daughter's a little brat, but she's a good girl. And sure. they're a happy family, and everybody's going to the football games, and they're just living their life, and they're all good people just having a life. Yeah. Just, yeah. just doing what they do, getting ready for prom, whatever. And then. The end. Yeah, and it's done so well where just in the background you kind of hear what's going on. Yeah, yeah. You know, Russia and and uh, and East Germany because at yeah. the time, you know, Germany was... Was split. You know, divided between communist and, and not communist. And, um, and it's just, it was vague enough to not blame anybody. Right, right. But realistic. And, I mean, it's almost, we were talking about, like, you put Ukraine there... Yeah, it's almost yeah. the same news, you yeah, know. Yeah. You you put Ukraine instead of Germany, and a lot of the stuff is happening. Yeah, yeah. ABC and local TV affiliates opened one eight hundred hotlines with counselors standing by. There were no commercial breaks after the nuclear attack scenes. ABC then aired a live debate on Viewpoint, ABC's occasional discussion program hosted by Nightline's Ted Koppel, featuring the scientists Carl Sagan, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, Eli Wiesel. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, General Brent Scowcroft, and the commentator William F. Buckley Jr. Yes, William F. Buckley Jr. All right, gentlemen, nuclear war, is it good or bad? Sagan argued against nuclear proliferation, but Buckley promoted the concept of nuclear deterrence. Yes, I believe we need to have nuclear bombs to deter others from mm, disparaging the United States. Sagan described the arms race in the following terms. Imagine a room awash in gasoline, and there are two implacable enemies in that room. One of them has 9,000 matches, the other 7,000 matches. Each of them is concerned about who's ahead, who's stronger. Yeah, it's, it's inane. It's stupid. It, it, yeah, my 9,000 matches is going to beat your 7,000 matches, and then we all die. Uh, the end. And they kiss and do. I think we should have nuclear bombs. I can't believe Henry Kissinger, that piece of ass, is still alive at a hundred and something years. He's a hundred yeah. years old. Yeah. Well, he's that never little melting die. off. Yeah, evil never dies. <laughs> Critics tended to claim the film was sensationalizing nuclear war or that it was too tame. No one could decide. No. 
Uh, the film received 12 Emmy nominations and won two Emmy Awards for Outstanding Film Sound Editing for a Limited Series or a Special and Outstanding Achievement in Special Visual Effects. Well, it should have had a lot more, but it was it was extremely controversial when it came out of because of the Rah Rah Reagan yes. uh, era. Because, you know, it's how dare you not say Russia did this. Of course. Because it was a time of uh, American exceptionalism, which, God, we still have that now. Which is basically it's just mutated into even nat- it's worse. Yeah, yeah, because it's the it's the myth that America can do no wrong. We're the greatest country in the world, yeah. and we look we're a good Setting country. Setting yourself up for failure. Yeah, but we're not the greatest country in the world right now. Yeah. We could be. We could be a lot better if we worked sure. for it. Yeah, we could be again the greatest country in the world. But you know, you can't just rest on your laurels and say you are when you're not. Right, right. It's the problem that we have <laughs> is just saying stuff that's not true. In the United States, 38.5 million households, or an estimated 100 million people, watched the day after on its first broadcast, a record audience for a made-for-TV movie. Yeah, I was one of them. Uh, Everybody. I'm sure my parents watched it. I'm sure I watched it. I don't remember, but I was young. The actor and former Nixon advisor Ben Stein, critical of the movie's message that the strategy of mutual assured destruction would lead to a war, wrote in the Los Angeles Herald Examiner what life might be like in an America under Soviet occupation. Bueller. Bueller. Do you have one of my greatest disappointments in life was finding out that Ben Stein was a huge conservative dick. <laughs> but he was a speechwriter for Nixon. I mean, it's like... I first saw him in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and yes, I thought it was hilarious. Of course. And then I learned he was just like... Oh. And when Ben Stein's Money was a fun show with Jimmy I, Kimmel. I know. It just made me so sad. Yes, because the way he talked made him seem innocuous. <laughs> but in reality... He was an awful human being. Yes, he, he, he still is. Uh, his idea was eventually dramatized in the 1987 miniseries America, with K, yeah. also broadcast by ABC. Uh, the New York Post accused Meyer of being a traitor, writing, Why is Nicholas Meyer doing Yuri and Dropoff's work for him? Phyllis Schlafly declared that, The film was made by people who want to disarm the country and who are willing to make a $7 million contribution to the cause. Yeah, Phyllis Schlafly. Yeah, I'm laughing at Phyllis Schlafly. She can take a Schlafly off a cliff. Oh. Uh, Richard Grenier in the National Review accused the day after of promoting unpatriotic and pro-Soviet attitudes. Why? How? Because it didn't say that Russia did the, the act first. It's so stupid. There is nothing pro-Russia at all in that movie. No. At all. No. This uh, is just idiots, man. This, it's the same idiots. It's just, if you... If you look at today and you're like, how? Look back, because there's yeah. been those idiots around since they since they first put, since a guy discovered fire, there was an idiot that was like, I don't want that. That's from the devil. And mm, yeah, put I that know, away. I know, I know. What am I going to do? Much press comment focused on the unanswered question of the film who started the war. Of course, that's just completely missing the point of the movie. Yes, because it doesn't effing matter. 9,000 like, matches or 7,000 matches, it doesn't it's matter. It's like... You know, you're you're up to your nose in a big old... You and me are up to our noses in a giant vat of excrement. And we're arguing about who farted. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. You know. Uh, U.S. Pr- President Ronald Reagan watched the film more than a month before its screening on Columbus Day, October 10th, 1983. He wrote in his diary that the film was... Well, dear diary, the film was very effective... It left me greatly depressed. And that it changed his mind on the prevailing policy on a... Nuclear war. The film was also screened for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. A government advisor who attended the screening, a friend of Meyer, told him... If you wanted to draw blood, you did it. Those guys sat there like they were turned to stone. Good. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You know, it's like, it's... It did... It was a very effective film. It did what it set out to do in a very frank and extremely realistic manner. Right? Yeah, as yeah. realistic as you could get at the time. Everyone, it, it, you talk about nuclear annihilation, and people say, "Oh yeah, well, obviously we're all going to die," but then it just be kind of come become complacent, and it's like, "Well, okay, well, well, but once you see how bad it actually is, yes, but that that is the reason why they were saying, "Oh, he's a traitor and all this," yeah. because by showing you can't rally behind nuclear war. If right. you know how horrible <laughs> it is, know yes, that everyone's gonna die. So they're basically saying that they're traitors by. Sh- it'd be like saying, "Well, uh, you're a traitor to this company because you showed that this beverage causes cancer by listing the ingredients." Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like no, it's just oh. telling the truth, man. 
Yeah, it's like the uh, big oil companies, like knowing full well what they were doing to the, the environment. Yes. But just kind of going with it. Oh, yes. Like, and whatever. They, if you, God, you talk against big oil, you're going to destroy our country. There's a paper trail about them knowing about just that they were destroying the environment and, and how to counter the actual facts. But yeah, nobody but cares. You can't make money off saving the environment, Jim. No, and, and, and making money is American. And if, you, if you're against no. businesses and you're for actually saving the planet, then you're a communist Marxist communist Marxist. Well, the irony is that within the next 10 years, you're probably making way more money off environmental stuff than anything with big oil. Yep. Anyway. In 1987, Reagan and Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which resulted in the banning and reducing of their nuclear arsenal. In Reagan's memoirs, he d- drew a direct line from the film to the signing. Reagan supposedly later sent Meyer a telegram after the summit. Don't think your movie didn't have any part of this, because it did. During an interview in 2010, Meyer said that the telegram was a myth and that the sentiment stemmed from a friend's letter to Meyer. Yeah, of course. He suggested the story had origins in editing notes received from the White House during the production, which... May have been a joke, but it wouldn't surprise me, him being an old Hollywood guy. I, we said this during yeah. the movie. If there's anything that's going to change Reagan's mind, it's going to be a movie. Well, Mother, now that I've seen this in the Hollywood way, I'm against it. They should have just made movies about everything and just showed it to him. <laughs> oh, I guess, uh, hmm, now that I've seen uh, The Birdcage, I'm for <laughs> homosexuality. They're, they're not that bad. No, they seem like good fellas. <laughs> the film also had an impact outside the United States. In 1987, during the era of Gorbachev's Glasnost and Perestroika reforms, the film was shown on Soviet television. Four years earlier, Georgia Representative Elliot Levitas and 91 co-sponsors introduced a resolution in the U.S. House of Representatives expressing the sense of the Congress that the American Broadcasting Company, the Department of State, and the U.S. Information Agency should work to have the television movie the day after aired in the Soviet public. You know, it was. It took four years for them to do it. And, well, they presented it as a comedy. Because, you know, America. Too soon. Mm. It's a very funny movie where America lose hair and teeth. Well, I mean, <laughs> McDonald's. Gorbachev was one of those people that realized just how bad it gotten. Oh, yeah. And, and was like, yeah, we got to do something else. Yes. Well, also... The Soviet Union had effed itself at that point. Yes. And, you know, we did Cold War them to death. (laughs) We were technically winning the Cold War. Yeah, because we spent more money. We had more money to spend than they did. And we spent it. And And we had an extra thousand nuclear bombs. Yeah. And so the result of that is Glasnost and then the country falling and then everything being in the hands of different gangsters (laughs) and and mobsters. Literally having some random dude go, hey, I got some nukes. This is cool. Yeah. And then we got pooty poots. Yeah. Oh, Uh, poots. Uh, In 2020, a documentary called Television Event, directed by Jeff Daniels, about the TV movie was released. Interesting. I'd Uh, like to see that. I would like to see it, too. Unfortunately, it's not available on anything that I could find. Bummer. Yeah. Uh, But anyway, that's all I got. Uh, It's... People need to watch this movie. Even now. Yes. yes. And the look, the effects aren't amazing. The... Mushroom cows look like a couple of booger clouds going up. They're yeah, all, green, all and, green. And, you know, and the the x-ray effect of the people, you know. But it, it still works it's because still of everything yeah. else. They actually use real footage of a nuclear blast. Yeah. Intercut and a with lot, all yeah, of this a lot of a lot of test footage and stuff of, like, houses getting destroyed and things like that. And it goes on for a, that's, quite a while. That's the big thing is that, yeah, it, you can look at it and go, oh, okay. And then it was by the time they released the third nuke on Kansas City yeah. that I was like, nope, this movie's not joking. No. Like, it's not joking. No, and they did soft pedal uh, radiation sickness. If you really want to see the actual horrors of that, yeah. watch Chernobyl. Yeah. Uh, or, or, yeah, find some footage from Also, Nagasaki honestly, or Hir- one, of, one of the best special effects representations of a nuclear holocaust is Terminator 2, still. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, With you the, know, yeah. it's very well done. Um, that is true. That is true, yeah. It is still a problem. Yeah. It is still a threat. Yeah. It is more of a threat today than it was in 1983, unfortunately. And... We've kind of just accepted that fact in a way that it doesn't creep into our brains anymore. You know, I don't think I don't think about nuclear holocaust very much. But I'll tell you this: after yesterday, I did. Yeah. Oh yeah. And 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 after yesterday, you know, I'm more 
anti. I've I've done a lot of anti nuke stuff in mm-hmm. in my time. I did. I was part of Mothers Embracing Nuclear Disarmament in oh. high school. We did a we actually did a show with Rob Williams. I think I told the story about meeting Rob Williams. It was a big mm-hmm. letdown, but but we sang this song about nuclear disarmament that our our choral teacher wrote. Oh, weird. And our class got up there and sang it in front of like 10,000 people in Balboa Park that were like waving these little oh, wow. flashlights around and and you know, I've done other I've been to other rallies and, you know, other concerts and things that are against, I mean, everybody's pretty much against nuclear war, <laughs> but, you know, that that is, a, is against this nuclear prolifer- proliferation. Yeah. And it is a issue that should be at the top of the issues. We should yeah. be disarming. Yeah. We should be getting rid of these nukes. There should be active, active, yeah, taking apart these nukes. All of them, rid of them, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. There should not be any nuclear bombs at all the fact that anybody has the this power of destruction is immoral yeah there's there's a uh, i want to say six more countries now than in 1983 oh, yeah. that have nuclear bombs pakistan uh france pakistan india yeah uh i think south africa maybe i'm not sure i don't remember specifically but, but i know that the you know it, yeah, Russia and America, it's a huge problem. But India and Pakistan is the real problem. I yes. mean, that's the, yes. that is the possibility, you know? And it, it, if you twist in, and this, I'm talking about zealots. If you twist in religion and zealotry, yeah. it becomes even more dangerous. Yeah. Because yeah. then you're doing this for God, for your God. Yeah. yeah. For your, you know, and you believe it is a righteous attack. Right. And that's the most dangerous because then you're coming at it with a way, well, we're all going to go to heaven and, you know, because we're doing the right thing. And Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay to die this way because it's, it, it's what I'm supposed to do. Right. It's what God wants. And it's, it's, that's what's scary. And also, you know, we've got a madman, a narcissistic sociopath. Not Trump. Donald Trump. No. <laughs> Donald Trump's say. boss, uh, Putin. Oh. <laughs> you know, Putin's got his hand on the button. Yeah. And he's in the yeah. middle of a war, and he is desperate, and he is being humiliated. And uh, yeah, he's the kind of guy that, you know, but the thing is, once you breach that, yeah. once you pop that bubble, once you take the toothpaste out of the tube, you can't yeah. put it back. Once somebody pops off a nuke, then yeah. it's done. It hasn't been done since World War II. Yeah. Rightly so. We've become, like you said, we've come real close, but we've had some angels that have saved the world by having, you know, cooler heads prevail. Yeah. Right? We don't have a lot of cooler heads. There's a lot of people in government now that I do not trust. Oh, yeah. I would not trust. Look, I don't want to get political, and this isn't, if there was ever a show to get a little bit political, it's this show. Sure. And... One of the things that we really, really have to take into consideration and worry about for the next presidential election is do we want a man who said that he is your retribution right, right, having his finger on the button, having the nuclear football, a guy who said that he's bringing Michael Flynn back in and all yeah. these kookity dukes, you know? Guys, guys who believe in the end of the world. Yes. Like, like the rapture. The and end all of this time. Stuff. Yeah. You know, the yeah. people that, oh, yeah, we're friends of Israel. But the only reason why they're friends of Israel is because when the last tree falls in Israel, that's when the end times come. So the it, it is all about promoting this evangelical uh, end times, yeah. Armageddon, apocalyptic BS. For them, it's bringing in the, ushering in the second coming of Christ and their whole, you know, kingdom of glory. Uh, but for the rest of us, it's a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. That it's, ends the world. It's us dying. And I do, I, that, look, a crazy man with his finger on the button is a crazy man with his finger on the button, you know? Yeah, yeah. You can say what you want about all this other crap, but that is important. Yes. Oh, man. I, I, I mentioned this on another show. But as a lighter note, when they had the scientists come out to unveil the new clock, yeah, they could have picked maybe one scientist that had a tiny modicum of personality <laughs> to give it a bit of gravitas. Right, right, right. Because right. it was like, ah, here we are, showing you what happens when a gerbil eats too much kibble. It had that same right, <laughs> sense right. of gravitas that the world is going to end. Um, God love them. But... Uh, Hey, do yourself a favor 
and watch this film. It is on YouTube. Uh, you can watch it for free. There's a really great print on there. There's but, an HD print yeah. that you can watch. Like, highly recommend it. It it you you need to see this movie. You need to show your kids too. Yeah. And look, I know it's not the most fun you're gonna have. You yeah. know, we weren't yeah. like high fiving and laughing and having a good time. <laughs> Of course, I would make some jokes just to lighten the mood. Right, right. But, you know, it's it's important to see even today what it – and, again, this is watered down, but it's right. the, one of the most realistic portrayals we have. Yes, yes. You know, except for Chernobyl. Yeah. You know, which is a – you know, that's a true account of what, right. you know, happened with a nuclear meltdown, right, you know. Right. But it's the same type of illness you're going to get yeah. from a nuclear yeah. bomb. yeah. yeah. And, you know, we have to be diligent about this stuff. And we have to make sure that we are vocal about ending this nuclear proliferation and getting rid of the atomic age. I mean, yeah. come on. We, we started doing it, and then we didn't. Right, right. You know? Right. And it's like all good, good intentions are great, but we still can destroy the world five times over. Yeah, I think the world's better off without having... Uh, sp- Adam splitting machines. Yes. Yes. I think we're okay. Yes. I, I like we'll Adam it. splitting machines because we need a lot of Adams. Yeah. That's just it. We're going to clone a whole bunch of me. Yeah, baby. That'll <laughs> stop nuclear <laughs> war. You want to talk about the day after? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> well, okay. So we got your vegetables out at the beginning. This is yeah. going to be the, the, the toughest of the bunch because we got some fun coming up. We got Soylent Green, one of my absolute faves. Yeah, she. Eat some Soylent Green, she. I'm oh, going to go. going to be so yeah. good. I'm so excited about it. And we got... Uh, Meteor. S- Ooh, Meteor. Which I've never seen. Oh, great. With Sean Conroy. There's a Meteor coming. We have to stop it. <laughs> and then, of course, we're going to end up with a, a little uh, bookend of a nuclear uh, annihilation with war games. He's still playing the game. It's still playing the game. <laughs> it's going to be a great month. I'm super excited. June Doom, baby. So uh, duck and cover, and we'll see you next week. The original Star Trek, Shane. I thought it was the original Star Trek, Shane. Yeah. yeah. We now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. Barney Miller, already in progress. <laughs>